In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There are some truths that we cannot learn and some wisdom that we cannot receive unless we face our greatest fears and our heaviest crosses. And that is what the Gospel is about today, about facing those very things, those very fears and those heaviest crosses that people bear. If I can give you the setting, set the tone for this Gospel. Jesus, for all intents and purposes, has been barred from the synagogue. The officials, the synagogue officials, have decreed that what he has been preaching is against what they believe, and so they have barred the doors to Christ. No longer wanted, persona non grata, keep out. So Jesus takes to the road as an itinerant preacher, and as we know in the Gospels, he enters into various towns and villages. And we know that Jesus is the Lord of the interruption. We know that when he goes into a town or village, he is inevitably interrupted by something. Either someone asking for something, or at times in which he has called his disciples out, let us rest for a while to a distant place, and all of a sudden the crowds follow him, and all of a sudden even their rest is disrupted and interrupted. Jesus is kind of the Lord, I think, of the interruptions, and he has something, I think, to teach us about that, that the very interruptions that we may experience in our life at times, be it inconvenient or maybe cause irritability or frustration or sometimes anger, becomes an opportunity for God's grace to come upon us in those unexpected moments in which we think it's inconvenient, but ultimately Christ is showing us something. In the midst of returning back to Capernaum, amidst the, the rabble, literally, of fishermen, farmers, peasants, here approaches an official of the synagogue, one of the officials of the synagogue. Now this was a man who had heavy authority. He carried great respect, and you wonder sometimes was this very synagogue official instrumental in keeping Jesus out of the synagogue? We'll never know. But we do know that he comes to the Lord with desperation. He has the heaviest of all hearts. His only daughter is dying. And so this man Jesus, this man Jesus, who appears to be a miracle worker, is in this town, and he says, I'm going to take the advantage of coming to Jesus, and I'm going to approach Jesus because I'm a desperate man, and maybe he can do something about this. He has this reputation. In another narration of this gospel, the synagogue official is basically giving instructions to Jesus how to do this. You know, lay your hands upon my daughter, you know, do these various things. In the Gospel of Luke, he doesn't go there. But we see a man who sees maybe something. He's grasping at straws, perhaps, at that moment. His faith is based on desperation. It's not a deep faith. It's not a deep abiding faith. You know, Jesus, my Lord, no. But he comes to the Lord in need. As they're approaching as they start their movement toward uh, the official's house, driver's house, an interruption takes place. And in this crowd of this jostling back and forth, Jesus encounters a woman, but he doesn't know this woman yet because all of a sudden he feels power going out of him. What was this woman about? This woman, for 12 years, which is the same age of Jairus' daughter, 12 years, has been suffering from a malady, a flow of blood, which does not stop. She's gone to various doctors, nothing has taken, you know, nothing, no cures, and possibly no hope of any cure. She has gone through all of her money. There's nothing left. 
And so she decides to come behind Jesus and touch his cloak. Now, because she has been seemingly, not seemingly, in the eyes of the law, she is <coughs> unclean because of the flow of blood. So she is ineligible to go into the temple. She can't go. And so she's been barred from the temple, which I think is caused, it sounds like it's caused her great distress that she hasn't been able to enter into the temple and pray and worship as she feels she wants to and called to do. And so in her simple faith, she touches Jesus' cloak, thinking, okay, if I just do that, and at that moment, Jesus turns around. Uh, he's turning around going, who touched me? And Peter said, well, duh, you're being jostled all over the place. Who touched you? Who knows? And then the woman fesses up. And with this very simple faith, and what was this simple faith this woman had? It was just basically, if I just get close to Jesus, if I just go into his presence, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be healed. Such simple faith, nothing fancy. If, I, if I'm just in his presence, that's all I need. And I have to trust him in that. And Jesus commends her for her faith. In the eyes of the world, she's no great theologian. She's probably illiterate. But Jesus turns to her because of her, she says, you have great faith, lady. You, you have been healed. In the meantime, as we know, as Jesus approaches the house of Jairus, news has come. Your daughter is dead. Imagine, your daughter is dead. All hope is gone. This done, Jesus can't do anything. Maybe in his mind, perhaps. What can Jesus do? And Jesus assures him, don't worry. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't lose hope. And when he approaches, he makes this declaration that she is asleep. The professional mourners are laughing at him, mocking him, saying, what do you know? She's dead. Asleep? Are you kidding me? Jesus dismisses these people, uh, paid mourners, to depart and with the daughter's parents and uh, Peter, James, and John, as it is said, they enter the house and Jesus bids her, Talitha Kuhn, little girl, rise. And little girl rises. Now remember, in, in, back in, in Jesus' time, 12 years old was the flowering of womanhood. And so in this story of Jesus, she, he restores her womanhood, but more he restores Jairus' faith. So what does he do? He takes just the faith of Jairus, which was, in a sense, minuscule. He, he didn't have much to bring in terms of faith, except desperation, as we talked about. But what he does is Jesus transforms that into something. It is said that he, Jairus, and his wife were astonished by what took place. Did they become disciples of, of Christ? It, it's not recorded, but there's a lot of things that are not recorded in Jesus' life that took place. I would think that they became disciples of Jesus. And I can well imagine that this very synagogue official, I'm just speculating now, this very synagogue official was probably shunned by the synagogue that he was probably leading eventually. I'm just speculating. But I'm saying that because when he experienced Christ not only touching his life with new life in his daughter, but he's also experiencing something that is intangible. And that is, who is this man? He's more than a man. And the synagogue official would grow in that faith because Jesus has touched him with that faith. And so what is the gospel teaching us today, brothers and sisters? I think in a lot of ways, 
You know, we, we speak of faith. And we know that in our Orthodox tradition, we're all about rela- experiencing God, right? The relationship with God is paramount in our spirituality. We don't go about trying to explain things away, but we are into relationship. And in that relationship with the Lord, we come to the Lord just as we are, just as the the synagogue official came to Jesus, just as he was, just as the woman with the hemorrhage came as she did, just as they were, one with a faith that wasn't fancy, but I want to be close to Jesus because maybe he can do something for me. Not maybe. No, it was beyond maybe, wasn't it? It was, I know he will. And then Jairus going, I don't know where to turn to. I don't know where to go. I have no place to go. My back's against the wall. And in those desperate times when everything, every human element cannot help me, any worldly element cannot help me. We can be like Jairus and turn to the Lord in our desperation, in our, in our weakness, in our powerlessness, and ask the Lord, come into my life. Come to my house, Lord. My house, my heart, my soul. Come to my house and just be there. And I entrust to you all my needs, all the things that are weighing upon me, all those things that are pressing upon me, because I have an assurance that you are with me and that everything that you do is for life, my life. You have said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. I have to trust you in this. And sometimes we have to say to the Lord, I think, Lord, I don't know what's going on, but I have to trust you in this. And so, what is the Lord teaching us today, ultimately, is that sometimes we learn wisdom through the pain, more often than not, but the Lord is in it with us always. And at times in which he seems the most absent, at times is the times in which he is the most present to us, in a, in a, in a way that we will never, never be able to decipher or understand in this life. But Emmanuel, God with us, is something that we hold on to and abide with. Christ with us, who walks with us and who in his compassion comes to us. And he's not expecting perfectionism in our life. When we hear, be be perfect as your heavenly God is perfect, we're talking about love here. Be love. But perfectionism, Jesus is not interested in that. He's interested in love. He's interested in us personally, as he calls us by name. And with that, we have the assurance that as Jairus, who was astonished, we too become astonished because look at me. I'm in this world. I'm going through the world with my various responsibilities, but God is with me. God is leading me. He's guiding me. And when I pray to him, he looks at me as I look to him. It's so intimate, so personal. You know, try to, you know, we try to grasp that. It's just so beyond our comprehension, but it's so wonderful. Because as he's called us by name, as I said, he says, as I've called you by name, then you be me. You be love. And any interruption that you may experience in your life, any inconvenience of time, learn from me. Because that can be an opportunity for grace. And that can be an opportunity to be my disciple in a very beautiful and powerful way. And so we see that as we say in the Elders of Aptina prayer, nothing, you know, everything that happens comes from the, from the hand of God. Nothing happens by accident, coincidence, or luck. So even the most unexpected things that happen to our life become 
occasions of grace, occasions of God's loving presence, as he leads us and guides us continuously into the fullness of life. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind always, now and ever, and on to the ages of ages.